Thank you very much. Well, officially welcome everyone to the Sterling Photography Festival Stories 2022 Zoom talk with Morag Patterson. Absolutely delighted to welcome you along this evening uh, on this lovely, certainly a lovely sunny evening here in Stirling. Um, we just wanted to acknowledge before we started this evening that we appreciate um, that we're in a period of mourning for the loss of uh, Queen Elizabeth. And we'd like to share our condolences with all those who are mourning the loss of the Queen at this point. Uh, this particular event tonight has been made possible um, by the support of um, Stirling University and their um, Environment Centre, who are planning this weekend to run a whole festival event um, on, on biodiversity. Uh, they took the decision um, that they, they would not run all of the events that they had planned and that they would postpone the majority of those until the new year. In discussion with them, we agreed that, that it would be appropriate for us to continue to run um, our Zoom workshops and uh, celebrate um, uh, biodiversity uh, and, and, uh, and continue with those talks tonight. Um, so thank you to the Festival of Biodiversity for their support um, for what we're doing tonight with, with Morag. Briefly before Morag starts, um, this year we decided uh, that our theme for the festival would be stories. It's Scotland's Year of Stories. Um, for those of you who are outside of Scotland, um, typically a lot of events and activities this year have kind of anchored themselves around that theme, storytelling. And we just thought how appropriate it would be for us to have the theme of stories as well. So in speaking with Morag, um, in, in, in inviting her to come and speak with us again, because this is the second year that Morag has done a talk with us, we thought it would be lovely for her to just reflect a little on some of the work that she has done over the years to share that with us uh, to the theme of stories. Um, Morag is uh, a, great, a great artist to work with, very enthusiastic and very open to sharing um, some of the, the detail of the more immersive and sort of personal work that she's doing as an environmental artist. Um, very community oriented, works very closely in her own community uh, in, in the south of Scotland and of Friesen Galloway, um, and is very active in, in, the, in the wider area of um, environmental protection and rewilding and so on. And, and, and I'm sure Morag will share some of the, the detail of that tonight with you all. So without further ado, I'd just like to thank Morag and welcome her and let her open up her talk um, and chat to us. Um, through the evening. So thank you very much, Morag, and welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, Janie, for the lovely intro and to um, Zaf for doing the technical work in the background and for you guys all for coming along. Lovely to see so many familiar faces here from across the world. Um, and thank you, obviously, to the, you know, the Sterling Photography Festival and the, the Festival of Biodiversity. I'll just go ahead and share my screen, Janie, if this works, hopefully. Pop that into slideshow mode. Everyone can see that, I assume. Some thumbs up from, yeah, great stuff. So in a nutshell, to kind of summarise what I'm going to be talking about, I'll be talking about the two countries that Ted and I make an annual migration between, which is uh, it's Scotland and Italy, more specifically the southern uplands in Dumfries and Galloway and the Ligurian Alps in, in Italy. And both of the places, I'll be talking about a very localised area, but they're both uh, being rewilded um, over different periods of time and we'll, we'll open up that as we go through. There's a bit of background about where this project started, it's a, it's a continuation of the Zero Footprint project that Ted and I have been working on for 13 years now, with all of the work created either at or near our, the two homes that we, we live between. Um, and you can, if you're interested in hearing a bit more about that, Ted will be talking about that in a biodiversity context on Sunday night at his talk, which I think mm -hmm. uh, Janie would be able to, or Zeph would be able to share in the chat. With respect to working so locally, 
I found that the limitation that I've kind of placed on myself has actually opened up the creative possibilities as opposed to limiting them, which has been a real delight because it could so easily have gone the other way and I could have felt really constrained. But I found the longer I stay there in one place, the more I notice and the more different techniques I uh, want to try out with the kind of and of the landscape. And if I had to sum it up, I'd say it's more of a love story than anything. Or a phrase I heard the other day, which I really loved was active devotion, which I think describes really well uh, the project that I'm gonna share with you tonight. It's, it's pretty much anecdotal, observational and non-expert. So I'm very happy to hear any corrections on plant or tree ids or you know people who have a different view on on anything i say because this is just what i've learned as a lay person um spending time in these landscapes and i will stop probably every 10 minutes or so and just ask if there's any questions uh because i think that will help break up me just talking constantly which might help give you all a better chance of staying awake for the for the hour and as well as those intermittent questions i will take a full open if people want that and feel like have a discussion, that would be great as well excuse so, me morag can i just yeah? before you get going there is quite a bit of chat and um, noise in the background i don't think it's coming from your mic but can i just ask everyone to put themselves on mute particularly those who are dialing in from an iphone because i don't have the function to mute you from my end so apologies for that um more no but problem it was just my intro really i can't hear it interestingly yeah i've had one or two people direct message me saying they're getting a lot of noise and i don't think it's from your end but um just if everyone could just check their own mute thank you yeah you might even be able to manually mute everybody from co-host i think i've tried to do that maybe so if you could look into that but i can't seem to mute the iphone okay but... OK, all right. And if it if it continues as a problem, you know, I could try and mute just to make sure it's not me. OK, thank you. Maura. No worries. Um, whoops. <laughs> Sorry, I, I had a, a pop up window on my screen there and I went on a slide by mistake. So just to give you the kind of overviews of the areas, these are the hilltops. So these are the, the peaks above the land I'm going to be talking about in more detail. Um, you can see they're both quite bare at the time of year the images were taken, but I wanted to just set the smaller conversations in this wider context. So on the left hand side, we've got McKilston Hill, which rises up behind Glen Howell, and it's uh, 294 metres high, a customary trig point, which we find on a lot of Scottish mountains, either a trig point or a cairn, and a trusty like of the dog, which some of you are familiar with from other Zoom meetings, probably. And then on the right hand side, we've got Monte Guardia Bella in Italy, which is uh, 1219 metres high. So for the Brits in the room, that's almost as high as Ben Nevis, just for the, the context there. But because it's very close to the sea, if you can see my cursor, that's the sea in the background. It has a much milder climate year round than, than Scotland does with much less chance of uh, snow and rain and it's actually obviously much more susceptible to drought than this hill over here and just to note obviously in Italy almost every hilltop has some very iconic uh, religious symbol on the top whether it's a simple wooden cross like this one or a gigantic statue of Jesus or uh, Mary the Madonna um, or, or a towering cross made out of scaffolding. It's, it's, it's quite normal to see that over here. So it was just to give you the, you know, the overview of the kind of wider landscape that we're sitting in in both places. And I, I did want to mention, because it often comes up around conversations about rewilding, especially there can be a bit of contention about whether rewilding means depeopling. And so, so while both of the places I'm going to talk about are rewilded, um, one of them is deliberate that we fenced off a piece of land and we planted our own trees and let the rest regenerate. And the other is driven by rural depopulation. But having said rural depopulation, our Rigo, which is where we live in Italy, still has a density of 36.86, won't go into that, inhabitants per 
kilometers squared, which is the official stat which you can get for every tiny region in Italy. Whereas the population in density in Dalry, and I've worked this out roughly because I couldn't actually find the stats. Um, so my back of a fag packet calculation is 12.84 inhabitants. So in a landscape that's very rewilded in Italy, the population density is still three times the density of our local population in Scotland. And I wanted to just talk about the boundaries as well a little bit because our land in Scotland is fenced off. You can see here on the left, we've got a double fence. That's partly to delineate our ownership or custodianship for want a better word of the land. Um, the second fence here is because after we had the big foot and mouth outbreak, um, gosh, over 20 years ago now, I think, we uh, farmers would want to put up a double protection to stop the, the stock mingling. Whereas in Italy, you can see um, we just have this very temporary, very impermanent and very occasional, I should add, a thin strand of electric fence. And that's more about sectioning the grass off to rotationally graze than it is to for keeping people in or out. Um, and you can walk for literally hundreds of miles here and never come across a fence or a gate because uh, people just don't fence off the land in the same way we do here. We don't even know exactly where our land ends. And the, the land ownership model is also very different here because you don't necessarily leave everything to the oldest kid, which is more traditional in Scotland. It's more, I think it gets divided even equally between your kids and you can't disinherit your kids. So the joke here is that for every five meters of uh, land, there's a new owner. And the other reason the fences are relevant, of course, because in Scotland, if we want to rewild or we want to plant trees, typically you have to put a very big fence in. We didn't hear because there weren't any deer at the time. So um, this fence wouldn't keep a deer out and we see them jumping over it regularly. Now they have appeared. Whereas in Italy, because there's apex predators, namely the wolf in this case, is one of the reasons why the deer population is so much under control. There's a lot more balance in, in the wildlife. And so the trees and the scrub can regenerate, re regenerate quite happily without any tree guards or, or fences at all. So it's just a, it's an important difference and we'll touch on the wolves again a bit later. So to show you what Glen Howell, our house in Scotland looked like uh, in 2009, and I've taken a screenshot off Google street maps, which I presume is legal given that they're credited on it. We've got a really blank slate here. This hill was all grazed by sheep, had been for decades. And you can see there's maybe some rushes here and there's maybe some bracken there, but it's a very just grassy hillside with not a lot growing on it at all. And then fast forward uh, to 2021 and you can see that this is absolutely covered in trees, some of which we've planted, some of which have uh, naturally regenerated. Um, and I should point out in case I didn't do it in the intro that these are my kind of well, these are Google photos, but the rest of them are scrapbook photos. So none of them are designed to be, you know, fine art or exhibited in a gallery. These are things that uh, catch my attention on a daily basis. And I just want to take a quick snap with my phone. And it will be interspersed with the chromatography, obviously, which I'll explain shortly. I don't have before and after pictures of Guardia Bella, which is the mountain here, because uh, obviously we've only been here for a few years. So I just put these context shots in, which I've just taken in the last week. And again, you can see the more open pasture transitioning down into scrub and then into the dense trees. And that's the, the Mediterranean in the background there. And then a closer up view so you can see the detail there. It's 66% forest if the stats I've read are right in Liguria, which is quite staggering compared to, I think Scotland's low twenties, England's maybe 13% tree cover. Um, so just to give you an idea of, of the difference. And if our friend from Finland was here who isn't tonight, I think uh, Finland beats them both even. Um, so when we moved to Italy, 
we had this dense, dense scrub and trees to navigate through. And it actually took us two weeks to find a way up the hillside by following these narrow cow paths and then having to clear out lots of brambles and roses. We actually thought we would never get there, but we eventually pushed through, partly due to being in quarantine for two weeks on arrival in Italy in uh, 2020, I would guess. And it was so hard and so difficult to navigate that we had to do this little hand-drawn map and we would, we would name objects and trees in the landscape much in the way I imagine people used to to be able to get our bearings and know where to turn left and where to turn right, you know, so it's kind of like up the cow path, not this way, in amongst the dense may trees, through the slows, the beast's lair, turn left at the juniper, uh, you know, you get the gist and, and we had to follow that map for a good couple of weeks until we actually had this path nailed down and you can see Lyca there going up some of the little avenues and, and the dense scrub. And uh, that's wave rock. That was one of the key points. And you can see it's got this beautiful wavy structure to it. And I still think of these objects even now with, with these names that we gave them originally. And so this is back in Scotland now, very different uh, picture. This is the, the track we made up to the top of the hill. We've got a wind turbine there. And we could walk everywhere when we first came here it was just grass there was nothing to hold you back on any part of the land so in absolute contrast to Italy we watched the land grow up around us whether because we'd planted it or because it naturally regenerated and it's just been unbelievably rewarding to watch the amount that has come out of the ground the diversity the abundance um Every time we come back in the autumn, we marvel at how much higher the vegetation's got and the different kind of architecture of everything. It's, it's quite astonishing. Um, I put this uh, slide in. I've got hardly any with text on, but we hear so often from people when they talk about planting trees or, or rewilding, you know, I won't see this in my lifetime. This is for my kids or the next generations to come. And yet this is in Scotland and 13 years in, we've already got a canopy uh, with the, the willow trees and it, it just blows my mind every time. And I, I'm so happy and grateful to be able to go and sit there with my back against a tree in the shelter and kind of listen to the leaves uh, rustling in the wind. And you can see there's a forest floor there as well, covered in leaves, no kind of grass in sight. And there's a lovely hummus growing up underneath that. Um, or developing, I should say, underneath that. And you see the brambles here, which in part are what let the, let the trees come through because they give a little bit of protection. And I could, I'm, there's going to be a lot of gratuitous tree photos in this talk, so you'll just have to indulge me. Um, and, and this one I've added just because it's the pond, uh, we, we dammed a stream because we wanted to create a bit of a body of water on the hill. It was a tiny wee burn and it has just grown up so well. These willows all self-seeded. We're not quite sure where they came from or whether the, when we broke the soil up, they regenerated out of that. Uh, there are a few cultivated willows up higher, which we were planning on using for making things from willow. But the, the ones on the left and the colourful ones are all regenerated. And this... The, this year and last year, this water has just been absolutely teeming with frogs and toads. In the spring, they're really, really noisy. Just, it's hard to describe, but it's the first time I ever kind of really understood what uh, Paul McCartney was getting at with his frog song. Um, obviously, they're more beautiful in the song, but I could see where he was coming from with it. And we have a, a heron fishes here. Um, most days it will just fly up slowly out of the pond when we approach. Uh, there's ducks as well that use this. And more than anything for me, it's just the place where I take my coffee every morning, uh, whatever the weather, I just put some mountain clothes on and uh, just go and sit down there and watch the sun come up over the hill and kind of reflect and prepare myself for the day ahead. And uh, a few more bits of foliage there. 
it's interesting that we're so taken by surprise. We planted all the trees down the slope because we knew we had a view that we wanted to look after and we didn't obviously bargain for all this stuff that would just grow on its own where it wanted to grow. And so now there's this constant conversation about whether these trees should be lopped so that we can still see the view. Um, I think over time we've decided we don't want to do that because we probably value the the habitat the trees offer, but I guess we could possibly keyhole over time um, if we wanted to. But I was thinking if I'd thought in advance, I would have run a poll in this talk, like do we leave the trees or not? Um, you can put your comments about that in the chat if you like. Um, I realize I've got quite a long way in without mentioning chromatography at all. Um, so these, I'm just going to explain briefly what the process is and, and how I started doing it. I went on a workshop with the Land Art Agency back probably a couple of years ago now. I think it was Hannah Fletcher running it. And I was just so visually attracted to these as a, as a piece of art um, in themselves that I felt like I had to learn, but I didn't have any kind of idea of what I wanted to do with it. And then as the land use debate and land use change has evolved very, very quickly in the area where we live over the time that I've been doing this, it suddenly became an important way of starting to bring different elements of land use change into a sort of wider conversation, particularly around what we're doing to soils um, and how we need to value soil in its own right as, you know, A, a carbon store and B, a, a source of regenerative nutrients if we look after it properly as opposed to just you know dumping chemicals and then fertilizer on it repeatedly so here we've got a uh, boggy soil semi-improved soil improved soil willow woods and and mixed woods and that's using the kind of um, standard habitat classification for soil which um, and for the for the land types which um, interestingly enough, for a talk about biodiversity kind of means precisely the opposite. So improved soil won't have an awful lot of biodiversity, whereas your kind of poor or semi-improved or marginal will be at the other end of the spectrum and, and have quite a lot. Um, and I don't think I've actually said already that the process here is um, making a bit of laboratory paper light sensitive by putting silver nitrate solution on it and then taking soil samples and uh, wicking that solution back up into the paper. And then you get this, you can read these uh, for soil nutrients and content and um, how well integrated the soil is and how available the nutrients are. And I've, I've just been given a grant this summer by um, BG Unlimited. So I've been learning to read them much more and uh, perfect the techniques. Um, but just as a, yeah, so I just that's the very basic things that you can tell from them. And then you go into more intricate detail about how close the individual bits here are together and et cetera, et cetera. But I could that would be an entire talk in its own right. So I won't won't do that tonight, but happy to ask um, answer any questions, obviously. Um, while I was doing the soil chromas, that was for an exhibition at a local arts centre. Um, sort of focusing around zero footprint and land use. I was drinking pine needle tea because I've been doing a lot of work on exploring how, if we're going to expand forest cover so much, what are the kind of alternative or wider uses that it has? So we're not just looking at the, the timber aspect. Um, again, another whole conversation for another night. But as part of that, I was drinking this, this pine needle tea, and I suddenly got the urge to go, what would happen here if I did the same thing as I've been doing with the soil, with the pine needles? And, you know, lo and behold, I didn't have any instructions. I just had to sort of follow my nose on the, the when I started working with botanicals. And we've got these, uh, yeah, this wonderful chroma, and that set me off on this. Um, the, the thing I'm still doing now, which I've been kind of doing quite obsessively all summer, which is, is going out and gathering. And this gathering and collecting is actually a really important part of the process for me. I really enjoy it. 
Um, and, you know, just everything I could find off the hill in Scotland, that was just what was had any life in it in January, which isn't a lot. So we got like Sitka spruce, uh, Doug, a Scots pine, eucalyptus, heather, all sorts of bits and bobs, and then brewing them gently down into these juices, which can then be extracted back up onto the light sensitive paper. And even the little bottles made a nice little exhibit in their own right like this. And I made these wee labels for them with the Celtic tree alphabet symbols on the back. Uh, this is what the house looked like in that, in that first flurry. It was really hard to stop because every time I thought I'd finished, I would see another um, plant that I hadn't noticed before. Uh, and the whole house was covered every surface. I either had papers in preparation or they were mid process or they were out drying like this. And you have to expose these to the light as well once they're all done and dry. Um, so that the house was absolutely covered. Luckily Ted was away when I started. So there was no one to have a tidy up for. I could just gradually cover every surface going. Um, so I'm going to go on to a little section about trees and bushes, and although it's broadly broken into sections, we can't really pass all biodiversity off, so there will be a lot of overlaps and, and circling back. But I just wonder, have, have there been any questions in, in the meantime, Janie or Seth? No questions so far, but just one vote to keep the trees. Keep the trees, good. Stephanie. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. One, one in my corner. Um, so, so yeah, this is just going to be a little walk around some of the trees and bushes that we've, we've got in both places. Um, and again here, I just wanted to put these in because you see how these oak trees are very happily just popping up in what's clearly a grazed pasture. You can see here there's the non-grazed bit where they're building up the hay, um, and this is grazed, but there's enough grass, uh, grass and the stock density is low enough that, that that can just go ahead quite happily. Quick slip. Um, so here we've got a hawthorn, one of my favorite hawthorn trees and a little, little Kramer attached to it there on the side. These aren't, you're not necessarily gonna be looking at the tree I took the Kramer from because it's a kind of much more ad hoc organic process than that and I might not be thinking of the two things at the same time if I'm gathering I tend to just gather and if I'm wanting to photograph something it tends to be on a different day and these are from the hawthorn berries they were pretty dried up to be honest which is why I don't think that chrome has spread out very well because you know I picked them in January when they should have been eaten by a bird already uh, and I I just on a couple of them, I've managed to pull uh, species counts off either Forestry and Land Scotland's website or the Woodland Trust's website. And they said there that uh, Hawthorne supports 300 plus other species. So it's always important when we're thinking about biodiversity and what's there, it's not just that plant or tree or shrub, it's all the other things that can live in it, um, you know, which often go uncounted. Um, with a lay person's look because they're you know they're just small insects um some catkins there in the in the gap between winter and spring i i, I actually did the chroma with catkins and they didn't produce a lot of interest in the chroma itself but i thought i wanted to share this uh, photograph anyway because they're so ornate it's incredible and it's the sort of thing you could easily just walk straight past if you were kind of preoccupied or you know or they weren't at your eye level and but actually they're really fantastical little pieces of plant and and well worthy of a bit of time dawdling looking at them this is the juniper tree that was also one of the things on our map you had to turn left at this tree and it was there's only one juniper so it was really easy to always know exactly where it was in in a very prominent position and we do we do have junipers in in both countries which is nice and then the the scots pine here which i noted off the internet supports 172 insect species and i was a little bit disappointed with this the way this one turned out because it was quite dull and there wasn't a huge amount of interest to it, which was a shame because it's one of my absolute favourites. And then in contrast here, you've got the, the Sitka spruce. This is a self-seeded tree, 
and the nearest the nearest small plantation is half a mile away and a bigger one is more like a mile and a half away so that gives you an idea of just how much these trees um will spread you know from from the commercial timber plantations that we've got it's a very very resilient tree um but it makes the most beautiful uh chromatogram really strong and sturdy and I'm, I'm wondering if there's a correlation between how robust a plant is and how strong the chroma is uh you'll see these are processed slightly differently the chromas and that's partly because I made a whole bunch of these when I was still in Scotland and I had no idea I'd be doing this talk. And then as I've been working uh, towards this, I've, I've made a lot of chromas for the talk actually, and then photographed them differently. So that's why there's a bit of disparity and some of them being a lot more luminous than, than others. Um, Leylandi, which, you know, is a very kind of controversial plant in, in Britain. Lots of people really don't like it. Um, but we, we initially planted it because we wanted to make a windbreak for our, where we thought our veg garden would be on the hill, which we were sort of horribly mistaken about on a rough uh, southwest exposed hillside in Scotland. And we ended up building a polytunnel in instead. But the amazing thing now is, because we obviously never manicured the Leylander, it's not turned into a big boxy hedge, it's just turned into this beautiful tree, which is kind of clearly providing a shelter and habitat for, for lots of beasties. Um, ditto eucalyptus, you know, big debate about whether we should have replanted three eucalyptus trees on the hill, but they were they were in the throwaway bin at Dobby's, the, you know, the equivalent of reduce to clear. And, you know, Ted and I really struggled to walk past a tree, basically. So we took them and we put them in and it, it's grown exceptionally well, particularly one of them. It's absolutely huge. There's big timber there. It's storing a lot of carbon. There's a crow that nests in it, which is really nice to see. Um, you know, and they, they are actually being trialled across Scotland as a, as a potential um, either timber or a carbon store crop, because obviously they grow so fast. Um, but yeah, very, uh, very controversial, uh, but make a nice chroma as well. Also lovely chopped up and put in your bath. Uh, good old holly, always a great habitat. And then the, the red berries in the winter. A few gratuitous tree shots here just because I kind of can't help myself and just wanting to say as well it's not all sun and games in Italy because we live so high we live at 800 meters we're quite often well up in the fog for weeks at a time just like we are in in Scotland it's very kind of damp and humid even in the winter here more gratuitous trees. This is just the bit where our kind of olive grove bit transitions into the forest, where we sort of first cut through the one small fence that the people had put round and um, made our way up the hill. Interestingly, it wasn't the uh, outside of the property the fence was on anyway. There's no delineation for that. It was just uh, to keep the bore out of the actual um, cultivated part. And we'll talk about bore a bit more later. So other uh, regenerated controversial type plants are a buddleia, which is uh, fantastic for wildlife, although could also be seen as invasive, but clouds and clouds of butterflies pouring off the bush every year. I don't know what it's been like in the UK, but it's been an absolutely fantastic bumper butterfly year here. I really have never seen so many. It'd be interesting to hear if it's been the same over there. And then, yeah, some... I can't quite see which these trees are, but I think it's a hornbeam, which is one of the kind of different ones we have. We've got broom here, which again is a really strong uh, chroma. It's really robust. And typically this is a plant that we talk about as something to be cleared or got rid of. It's a, it's a nuisance and it's ugly, but again, it, it really is a, a beautiful plant in its own right. And you can make, uh, I think it's broom wine from it. It smells great. So I'm just sort of standing up for all the plants that people hate. And this is gonna come up again later on. Um, a few more canopy pictures, just cause uh, I can't get enough of them. Gratuitous sun shining through tree photos, repeats. <laughs> and then, yeah, a few more 
chromatograms of, of the, the trees. So these are both oaks and one was done in the spring and one was done more like in July. And I'm not sure with these whether the one on the left hand side has a lot more kind of interest and punch and power in it than the one on the right, which was taken in a period of drought. Um, and in the work I did where I was learning about the chromas, you know, they, um, Juan told me that that you'll never get two the same and they're always going to be different at different times of the year because obviously you've got the sap rising you've got lots and lots of changes going on and the sugars and the composition and the sort of internal biochemistry of the plant so really interesting to work with things seasonally as well the lovely white beam i think it's a silver leaf white beam but i'm not sure but you get to see the picture on the right there. This is all grazed by um, cows just freely. And, you know, you have this wonderful um, kind of agroforestry, I guess we would call it in Britain, set up, which is quite under underutilized at the moment, I think, but hopefully it might be a bit more the way we go, because obviously trees have a huge amount to offer animals in terms of minerals uh, from the leaves and shelter, et cetera. It's been nice working seasonally as well because I've worked here with the blackthorn leaves in the spring and then worked with the berries later in the year and get that fantastic slow colour. And this is one of my favourite trees, but this one has the processionary caterpillar on it sometimes, which is a sort of horrible insect. I hate saying that about insects, but they can be deadly to dogs, especially the pine version. So. Um, that doesn't get a very good write up in my book. And I, that's one creature I really wish we didn't have around. I think they are marching into the south of the UK now. We've got Aspen, which is a real treat in both places. I'm looking forward to seeing how the last lot we planted in Scotland are getting on. But we've also got these curious patches of uh, the, there's a, I can't think, it's probably like five meters by 10 square meters right up on the hill in the open field where there's just a solid block of these I think they're aspen trees and I've got no idea how they got there I'd be really interested if if anyone uh, with more experience than me could suggest because to me it must be the birds dropping a whole bunch of aspen or some sort of root migration but I can't see any other aspen around or I guess something very old in in the seed bank uh, but yeah lovely to see and it'll be beautiful when they grow up into a big stand of, of shimmering aspirin we have hornbeams here which is something I, we certainly don't have on our patch in Scotland but uh, it's the the forest here is probably predominantly hornbeam and oak I think um, that's a hornbeam in action and I'll just do a little shout out to the insects while we're looking at this one, because for the last six weeks or so, I've seen on the hill and just on the tarmac road down at the bottom, these little processions of ants carrying these individual flakes off the kind of the hornbeam. I don't know whether you'd call it fruit exactly or seed. Um, and the ants are a fraction of the size of these seeds. And you'll see a whole procession of them, maybe 10 meters long, carrying them in both directions. So I'm not sure if they're using them as food or bedding or, or what they're up to, but it's really, really interesting to watch. I've lost a good half hour just kind of peering at them and trying to work out where they're going from and to. A little field maple there. And then the goat willow, the, the willows come up so often in this talk and they're, they're one of the trees that when they first started coming, we kind of thought of them as scrub because that's the designation they get, um, at least partially, um, and a word as if that's a negative thing. And so for a while we're thinking, oh, we maybe need to clear this scrub away. And then we realised what an amazing habitat they are for the birds and, and sort of gradually, and also became more informed by speaking to people locally and then figured that we just had to completely reevaluate the way we looked at them. And now they're one of my absolute favorites, as you can probably tell. And when we talk about rewilding, there's quite often a perception that we're just doing rewilding for rewilding sake for biodiversity and you know, carbon storage and habitat. But you know, these are useful trees um, that can be used for fiber, fuel, medicine, 
and I've made this stack of paper here from the willow trees out the front of the house. I was trying to see if I could make anther types a different photographic process on paper I'd made myself. And so I literally had to strip the willows, which I guess is where the song comes from, um, and pull out the inner lining of the bark and, and make this very, very rustic paper, which I don't think anyone would be running through their printer in a hurry. Um, and yeah, it, my hands were so, so sore. I did this for two days straight before I got enough just to make this little pile of paper here. But yeah, we're, we're thinking about the plants and the trees that go up in, in other contexts too. We've got the hazel here, which, you know, obviously great squirrel food. We haven't quite got the squirrels up as far as us in Scotland yet. They're about half a mile down the road. Um, but here we've got these kind of door mice as well, which love hanging out in the in the hazel trees. Ash. And when I tried to plant ID this one, this is in Italy, it came up as manor ash, which I'm not sure about. But yeah, it does have these sort of very different uh, flower heads on it to what I'm used to seeing in, in Scotland. And obviously in the UK, we've lost a lot of our ash trees to, to the dieback. So it's quite nice to see at least some variants carrying on happily here. Good old cherry. I think the birds have spread the cherry trees. Certainly the ones in Scotland seem to have been possibly planted by birds. And the European plum, which I included here, it's a very you know, inconspicuous plant in the woods and on the hill, but it makes this beautiful little chroma with all these different color variations in it. You know, the oranges going into the brown and the hints of blue. Um, and really kind of strong delineations of the, the radial areas as well. So I just wanted to sneak that one in. Now I've called this plants plus because I'm gonna stray off into mosses and other things that might not be typically classified as plants. Is there any questions, Janie, just before I? No questions thus far. Um... Okay. Someone has asked, have I missed what part of the tree is used to make the chroma? Sorry, good point. No, I've been using the um, leaves. So the leaves or the berries, if, it, if I, one or two, I think I specify berries, but on the, all of the rest of them, it's leaves or obviously like pine needles in the case of the, the conifers or needles um, in the case of the conifers. But that doesn't mean I couldn't actually try with the bark and the other bits as well. It's just been the kind of way I've been drawn uh, to begin with it is to start with the actual leaves. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, in, into the plants, we've got some lovely orchids there from the top of the hill here. And the, the pasture here, as soon as you come out of the trees and where the scrub begins, you, you just, we've got endless uh, flower meadows from about April excuse me, they finished a little bit earlier this year because there was drought. So even in July, the flowers were starting to fade, whereas normally we'd see them go on until September. It's been so dry, in fact, they've had to feed the cows hay in summer this year, which is unheard of and really, really worrying for the farmers. But, you know, on a happier note, here's a beautiful field of um, narcissi stretching as far as the eye can see. Uh, I think it's a lovely silver birch there in the middle. And the smell from this is just incredible. I could just go up there and sit for hours and just let the, the smell waft over to me on the wind. And then, you know, that will get succeeded by a different flush of flower. And, a, you know, that will last for a week or two and then more will come in. And I, I'm going to show you a selection of them here. Uh, what happened was I... At the beginning of the spring, when the flowers started coming out, I thought I'm going to make a chroma of everything. And so for a week or two, every plant I could find, I must say, if I felt something was rare or there wasn't enough of it, I wouldn't make one. It was only if it was really, really abundant and I felt I absolutely wasn't going to impact its um, existence. Um, but, you know, I soon found out after the first probably two or three weeks that there was absolutely no way I could keep up with this unless I had you know, a full-time job and could just commit my life to it. So, so I'm gonna show you a lot as a, to give you an idea of the diversity, but it, it in no way encompasses everything that's there. Um, and I'll just show you a few from Scotland. I, Cause 
because I left Scotland before most of the flowers were out, but um, here's a couple of, of the few things that were around when I was there. So we've got two different heather ones and you can see these are wildly, wildly different. And the one on the right is so incredibly like a flower. It really kind of took my breath away when it first came out. Um, you know, because this is just the liquid pulling through the paper. It's the own rate and the different compounds dividing out. I'm not influencing it at all. The only changes you see are by nature of what is in that uh, solution. Um, and they're possibly so different. You know, maybe I had maybe I had some twigs in the second uh, version. I'm not sure. You know, maybe one was just the flowers and a bit of greenery and the other one. I either steep longer or, or had a lot of twigs in, which, which could explain the difference. Uh, but I'm not sure it's another, another avenue for me to kind of explore as I, um, you know, take how you read these, these chromas more into consideration. And there's some rose hips. They were pretty dried up too, to be honest, which also might kind of account for the, the whiteness in there. And then transitioning from Scotland, Scottish ferns on the left into Italian ferns on the right, you know, you can see again, they make quite a strong, a, a strong image. Um, and maybe again, that's a testament to how kind of resilient they are as a plant. And then, you know, talking earlier and coming back to plants that we kind of love to hate um, in Scotland, certainly, you know, rushes are quite high up there on the list. If you've ever farmed in, well, certainly our neck of the woods, rushes are something to be eliminated, obliterated. I th as far as I can tell, basically just because they're taking up grass space that could be eaten. And animals don't tend to eat rushes unless they're very sweet, because I think you could, people used to say you could put calcified seaweed on and it would make them sweeter and the cows might eat them. Uh, but regardless of that, in their own right, rushes are a really, um, you know, a good shelter and, and plant for animals to use. And so here, of course, we've got the, um, the narcissi that I was just looking up before. I think those rushes have, have got slightly out of place in this talk, so I'll probably be coming back to that. Um, again, the narcissi going into the hazel woods, which are, you know, that you can see a history of coppicing here by all these uprights that are growing um, and kind of quite thin sticks out of the ground. Good old grass, just uh, plain. I don't know what type of grass it is, if I'm honest. It's the very lush grass that you, you get in the woods. The brambles, which we've, we again, going back to the plants that people uh, complain about, they're actually an amazing food. They're full of vitamins. I think uh, you can use the leaves as a sort of herbal tea or a medicinal drink. And they also, you know, can help the trees to grow up because they provide a little bit of protection about from grazing animals. And I, I think it's quite ironic that you could sort of almost, it wouldn't be too far fetched to think of someone cutting these brambles down in one day and, and then going to the supermarket later in the year and buying a nice tidy punnet of blackberries. And so on the left, again, you can see I've worked with the, the leaves of the bramble there earlier in the year, I think that says April. Um, you can just very faintly see where I've annotated them with the name and the date. And then just last month, a month ago, that was uh, using the, the blackberries themselves. So again, you know, nice transition of, of working with the different parts of the plant. We've got some Scottish Italian ivy here, Scottish on the left, a beautiful, dynamic and really, really clear chroma there. You know, everything is so well defined and, and actually quite colourful. Um, obviously, I had to be quite careful. You know, ivy is poisonous, so I was quite careful in my handling of that. Um, you know, and a, a shout out for not pulling ivy down. It, it's also a wonderful habitat um, and shelter. Oh, was that somebody asking something or just someone off mute for a second? No, someone was asking in the chat about who it was you worked with. It was Hannah Fletcher. Is that right? When you did it? Um, yeah, I did it. The initial workshop was Hannah Fletcher and the guy I've been learning um, more intensively with this summer. I, I'm just trying to get his name right. I think it's Juan Fran Lopez from Spain. 
Um, but I could, I could, um, you know, if people are interested, I can put the links up and once we get to the end and into the chat, if that would help. Um, or certainly I could mail them out afterwards if, if I can't find them quickly enough. Um, uh, Bracken's another kind of controversial plant. The, the emerging work on it, I think, uh, says that it's actually a really good carbon store. So, you know, although we, you know, quite often spray it with chemicals still for either trying to have less of it on our grazing lands or ironically now for planting trees to sequester carbon, I think it will be really worth keeping an eye on, on the research uh, that's emerging and, and seeing where that goes. It's never been one of my personal favorites because I always get covered in ticks when I come out of the bracken and, you know, I don't mind them. I mean, they're not nice ticks, but I don't actually mind them per se, but obviously they're, you know, with Lyme's disease, it's a bit of an issue these days, isn't it? Um, ever more prevalent. So, um, and a nice little chrome of the bracken on the right there. Dandelions, you know, to probably round up the plants that people love to pull out their lawns or put weed killers on, a great source of food again in small doses. They're very bitter, a uh, great medicine, and also a fantastic early plant for the for the pollinators to enjoy. Not to mention for all the photographers here, one of the most exquisite subjects to work with, especially once they, you know, turn into the, the seed heads. So much potential. I'll just run, this is a kind of bunch to just show you some of the plants, often with the, often went for the name as opposed to the actual chroma on some of these because they're so cool. So you've got calvetch, old man's beard, uh, hairy greenweed, really strong chroma again, sweet briar rose, buckler's mustard, lovely yellow one, the Montpellier milk vetch, the rock rose, the smooth hawkweed, you can imagine these are just every day you go up there, there's another bunch of plants that um, weren't there a couple of days before. The humble daisy makes quite an interesting image. Thyme, we'll come back to some herbs in a minute. Blue-eyed Mary, which we're both delighted by when we found the name for that. And this round leaf geranium, I put this in with this photo because this actually shows you as well as anything the kind of depth of, of the uh, flower meadows that grow, you know, and they'll be like that for maybe May, yeah, May through till September, just this wonderful, deep, deep litter of different flowers and absolutely alive and teeming with insects, with crickets and butterflies and grass mites, which aren't quite so nice if you end up sitting in them. I give you a good couple of weeks itching. But you know, all sorts of, I couldn't even begin to kind of name the amount of, of creatures we see in here up there. But it also kind of demonstrates the potential for erosion on the hill here. This is a cut by the side of a track. So this is more deliberate, but in general in Italy, this is um, very, very prone to erosion and really, really devastating landslides which are always a risk in the sort of severe weather events that we see ever more frequently. Ribwort plantain, another really uh, undervalued plant. I think, I think it's edible for in salads, but it's also uh, medicinal. White asphodel, and I just put this one in A, it's a beautiful chroma, but B, the, the plants just seem so exotic out on the mountain. And you can see, because everything else is quite green and not so colorful, they're one of the earlier plants. Um, but yeah, they, they're quite striking. They're really big. Um, and I wanted to touch as well on how I'm having to avoid some plants altogether. Like now we've got aconite on the hill. Um, I think it's aconite, which is also called wolfsbane and, you know, it's deadly poisonous. And I have heard that you can even die from just skin contact with the plant. So that's one of the ones I just don't go anywhere near at all. The good old wood anemone. Um, this is a more slightly different version actually to the wood and animal we see in Scotland. This is one that grows on the open hill. So I need to have a look and, and see what specific variety that is. Common milkwort, bulbous buttercup, greater yellow rattle, common's birdfoot trefoil, rock soap, uh, rock soapwort. That one's fascinating to me because it's um, used to be used in soap making and I had a side hustle as a soap maker for a long time. Uh, Meadow Clary, Hairy Vetch, great name. 
And then mosses, I wanted to just include some mosses. These are from Scotland because we hardly have any mosses here. It's not really wet enough in the boundary layer that mosses inhabit. Um, Ted and I did a course on mosses during lockdown just because we wanted to, to learn more about them. And one of the things they said was go out and look at how many you know, mosses you can spot on your land. And it was just incredible. We could have, uh, I didn't think we ever finished counting or identifying. So we don't really know the names of these, but I just took a few snaps of, you know, just to record the, um, the different types we had and to hopefully be able to identify them uh, when we get time to sit down. And obviously you can see these are just snaps, but there's huge photographic potential with these um, interesting little miniature world as well. I'll just go over the herbs quite quickly because I've got to get onto animals and I don't want to talk so long that you're all asleep. Um, so we've got, you know, sage and lemon geranium, which are both cultivated for food and medicine and keeping insects away in the case of lemon geranium. And then we've got the wild herbs of this mountain, uh, the aromatic ones at least, are lavender and mountain thyme. And it's really beautiful because you can be walking up there with a dog and these smells are just releasing underfoot. And I quite often just pop a bit of either into my mouth actually and, and chew it on the way up or down the hill. Lavender, if I feel like I need to calm down and mountain time for the opposite probably. And then, yeah, there's just some mint and that is actually, we haven't cultivated that, but it is just it is from cultivated mint, I believe, that is just sort of springing up between the cracks in the garden. And as you'd expect, quite a dynamic chroma from something so uh, fragrant. Fabulous fungi. I haven't put a lot in here because mushrooms here either tend to get eaten very quickly or could be poisonous. Um, a couple of quirky ones that I've found on my travels. But, you know, any time when the fungi come up, the hill is just absolutely covered in people. I would say if I had to put an average age on them, it would be 75 or 80. And it's just so traditional here to be out foraging in the mountains and in the woods for fungi. It's, uh, it's just part of everyone's life. And if you're, if you're not an expert, but you want to try it, you can go to the pharmacy and get them ID'd. Um, but it is amazing, the people here you know and into very very old age are still very much working with the land whether that's foraging or um for herbs and and mushrooms or whether they're getting their own firewood in or or working their their vegetable patches and they do all seem to live to to a ripe old age as a rule i'll quickly skirt through this animal section so we can all have a bit of a chat if you're still there at the end um so we've got, there's a, this is quite a typical scene. If I'm just sitting up on the hill, having a think on one of my thinking stones, I'll look around and there'll be all these cows just looking over the, the hill behind me. They're very, very chilled out, um, th this herd anyway. I can walk right through them even when they've got calves and I've got the dog with me, which I wouldn't dream of doing in Scotland. Even with the dog on a lead, I, I wouldn't probably wouldn't even go in a field with, with Galloways, with, with calves. And then back in Scotland, we've got the, the Shetland sheep further up the hill, bit of a gratuitous full moon shot. Um, I mean, including them because, you know, it's, we have to talk about, you know, kind of man and rewilding and using uh, land for food, you know, all in the same conversation. So, I made this with some Shetland sheep wool. So it's a different type of sheep to the ones you just saw in the pictures. And it's actually pretty old wool that was spun from sheep we cut donkeys years ago, like 25 years ago or something back on a, on a different farm. Now, this is where I got into how do I represent animals? I, um, and I started working with uh, cow poo and cow droppings. Um, it's not the specific one you're seeing happen on the left there. But funnily enough, when I was waiting, I wanted to do a cow poo, but it was such drought, I had no idea where I was going to find a you know, poo with enough moisture in. And a bull just walked right in front of me as I had that thought and delivered one <laughs> right there for me, which I, I could collect. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, if you if you're 
looking at uh, making fertilizer from cow dungs or, or any other uh, type of fertilizer, you can measure them using this method. Um, and you can see exactly what its uh, constituent parts are, what it contains, um, how available those parts are for the soil and adapt it. So if you've taken your soil sample and you know what's lacking, you can make a fertilizer to exactly fit it, uh, which is you know, very useful science, especially for uh, smaller farmers. And then I did get into picking up the animal poos that I see on the hill quite a lot. I didn't relish this at all. I kind of wanted to use the poo to bring the animals in, but I hated handling it and I felt really squeamish about the whole thing. Uh, but I decided to crack on regardless because I kind of couldn't work out how I'd bring the animals into the talk otherwise. So this is a uh, wild boar, I think. I've put written large dropping on it and you can see the kind of where the wild boar have dug up the hill. And funnily enough, we've got wild boar in Scotland as well. They're not everywhere, but we've um, some got released 20 odd years ago. And so now they're, they've been sort of recolonizing the place where we live. And I do have to be careful maybe a few times of the year. I just have to not go up my usual walk because either one will come across right in front of me or I'll be trying to navigate up a narrow patch and I'll just hear this warning growl from the bushes. And sometimes I'll think I've imagined it and try and carry on and it will come again. And then uh, at that point, I just think, no, OK, I'll just leave the leave the hill to you for a few days. Um, and then we've got here what I loosely think is probably a fox poo. Um, that, you know, there's a lot of foxes on the hill. I see them really regularly. And now we've actually got our very own fox, which has been stealing shoes from our house for the last couple of weeks which has been quite funny as I've been preparing these um, chromatograms from droppings. We, we, there was a mystery to begin with, where are these shoes gone? And then I thought, I'll just go and check on that bit where I've seen the fox sort of slinking off down the, the garden. And sure enough, there was one dropped there. I think it had tried to pick up two at once and maybe bitten off more than it could chew, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, so yeah, I didn't realize it was a thing, but we looked it up on the internet and apparently foxes are very famous for stealing shoes. Uh, these were in our hallway as well. They were inside the house, but we were just leaving the doors open because it was hot. So, you know, very cheeky. And we had a friend staying the other day who was just sitting in the doorway and said the fox was just going right up and down the driveway, just a couple of meters in front of him quite happily. So yeah. Uh, nice, nice little things to have around. Um, the, I mean, the numbers of the animals here don't get so out of hand. You know, we've talked about the, um, we'll mention the wolves again in a minute, but because they're hunted, as well as the, the foraging culture that we just spoke about, um, hunting is taken very, very seriously here. And for two days a week from October through till either January or February, the hunters are out you know, and, and they're hunting for meat as much as pleasure that, you know, it's a, very much a staple in, in any restaurant or household, the, the wild boar here. A few tracks and traces of, these are in Scotland, we've got a big foot of bird and a hare. The hares are very um, common in Scotland, less so in Italy, although I have been served one in a restaurant one, once, which might be why then not so regular and a few just tracks and traces and dens and lairs uh, where the animals scurry into the undergrowth and the dog loves trying to get away from me and sniffing those out we have lots and lots of interesting insects and butterflies i think this is a fox caterpillar this one um and then reptiles you know and this one is is um hanging out in the aftermath of a forest fire which i just included because you know, it kind of just illustrates how difficult, uh, you know, we worry about the fires for ourselves. We've had three on the hill this year, but, um, you know, for animals, it's uh, a disaster. And then we've got the spider from hell, I like to call it. Um, 
you quite often when you're walking because it's through such um narrow undergrowth you quite often just get a whole face full of cobwebs like this that you didn't see coming and you know when you've got these monster spiders that can make you jump a little bit um and there's a couple of poisonous spiders around as well i've had a bite or two that have gone a bit quirky um a huge huge worm i put my hand in there for a scale and obviously the insects we've live in a wood and so the the insects quite rightly think of their our house as their house as well so there's quite a lot of sharing going on and we actually have to quite often do a scorpion sweep in the bedrooms if, if people come to stay because they do like um hanging out in my room in particular um and so to to bring the insects in i was trying to figure out how i was going to do um chrome as what was i going to use and I do have some dead hornets around and some dead scorpions, you know, animals that have, you know, died naturally and butterflies. And I was thinking about using them, but I actually found I couldn't when I went to do it. I felt like it would be really disrespectful and I suddenly had a very strong feeling not to do it. Um, so I had to improvise again. So I used old cobwebs that I didn't feel like were in use anymore. Obviously took them from someone else's house because I wouldn't have them here. Um, I made a chroma from them and you know just showing you the butterflies again because we did talk about them earlier we had a I, i've got no idea on butterfly names whatsoever but we did have swallowtails here which was um really beautiful to see this year and then again wanting to keep a little thread of the insects going with the chromas i made this one with um a hornet's nest that we'd taken out of our chimney and there were some little remnants of it left. And I, I figured actually not much would come out of it in a chroma because uh, it was quite dry, but obviously there was quite a lot in here. This is actually bodged a slight bit in a Lightroom experiment I was doing the other day. Um, but, it, but what it does do, although it's um, exaggerated, is really show you some of the different dynamics of, of what came out in that chroma. And from something that's really like a just a papery husk, that was quite surprising, um, which does lead me to think that the tree barks and things could be quite interesting. Going back to the wolves again, this is a huge difference between um, Scotland and Italy, because obviously we haven't had wolves for a long time, whereas here they're kind of part of the furniture. This bit on the left here is called the Paso del Lupo, the Pass of the Wolf. We do have wolves the, on this hill. A calf got bitten, I think it's either a year or two years ago now, and it, but it was okay, you know, it needed some treatment. But there is tension because they do occasionally come down and take smaller stock, which is obviously upsetting for farmers, um, possibly more so when you only have a relatively small herd. Um, but yeah, we haven't seen one on this hill ourselves, maybe because we always have the dog. But if you go up to this bit further in the background, which is the Passe del Mazzaluna or the Half Moon Pass, I've seen a wolf in the mountains just across here. Um, I had a really beautiful encounter with one. I was out with my son in the hills and we just, I didn't have the dog for once, which is really rare. And we just both saw it and stopped dead and just like dropped to the ground so we could just look at it. And it stood stock still and we all eyeballed each other. I don't know how long for, but it was a while. And there was no, didn't seem to be any fear on either side. We were all just still looking at each other. And then it just gradually sloped off up the hill and we kind of just watched it till it disappeared into the distance. Um, but it is funny the, the difference there between Scotland and, and here, because, you know, there's still, almost feels like we're living in Red Riding Hood land a little bit in Britain. You know, even if it comes to having a conversation about wolves, it's it's quite hard for it not to get very emotional um, very quickly. Um, but while recognising that there's tensions, there's also a lot of benefits by the way they keep the deer numbers down, which is something we, we struggle with hugely in Scotland. Um, and I like to think this is a wolf print on the right hand side, but, you know, I'm quite happily to be told otherwise by someone who's a track expert, track identifier. A quick word on the birds. We have um, a huge amount of birds in Scotland where we can feed them. 
because the house is occupied year round, whereas here we won't feed them because we go away in the winter and we don't want them to become reliant on us. Um, also, they, they hunted birds, even small birds for food until quite recently here, which I think has had a sort of big impact on the general populations. But in, in, in Scotland, we have a wind turbine, you know, and people often really worry about word, the birds with wind turbines, but I've never found a dead bird there. There's even a kestrel that hovers right next to the turbine, and I think it uses it for camouflage so the creatures on the ground can't see it hunting. What is a big risk to the birds is our house itself in Scotland, because we've got so much glass, the birds come and they fly into the windows and knock themselves out. Excuse me. So you see we have these little visitors that we have to bring in and we'd learnt from someone locally that if you just sit them in your hand or you sit them in your jumper for a little while, um, varies from bird to bird, they quite often just come round and, and will fly off again in the end. Uh, although some of them actually almost want to stay with you once they've, they've been in a nice warm house for a while in January. Um, we have a few that don't make it, but you know the great majority of them do, especially if you find them quickly. And then on the right hand side, it just this is bird. And I found bird on the road, n almost no feathers at all. Um, and it was absolutely certain to get run over. There was no way the nests were all really high up overhanging. There's no way I could kind of put him back or leave him for the mother. So we brought him just back along the road to our house and reared him. We, well, I say him, like we've got no idea if it was a him or a her, but he just sort of was a him. <laughs> Um, and we reared him in the house for a couple of days until he felt more confident and then he went out and lived in the apricot tree and as he started growing feathers and was able to move more he would fly around the house and see which room we were in and because our windows were always open you would just hear the call of bird and then the next minute he would just like fly in and land on you right here and you're in the middle of a meeting with someone and you know suddenly you've got this little sort of squawking companion with you but we do miss him or her. Uh, we're not quite sure what happened. We kind of like to think it flew away, but you know it's quite possible it got taken by another bigger bird or um, if one of the farm dogs was up visiting. But lovely, beautiful, intelligent little companion. It's amazing to watch watch the development of the kind of um, the way he was learning to do things. And so in, in honor of birds, I obviously didn't want to work with avian droppings because, um, you know, with bird flu and everything, it's a bit of a risk at the moment. So I used some feathers. I had a, some jay feathers, not from that jay, um, and raven feathers. So I mixed the two together and, and made this chroma sort of as a way of, of documenting them into the story. Um, and then, of course, you can't talk about uh, creatures on the hill without talking about us. So I uh, tried out a chroma with urine, which obviously also could be used to measure, um, to improve your compost or whatever. Um, and just wanted to show you these round circular huts that are built all over the hill. The hill's littered with them. I think Ted uh, started to uh, take pictures of them thinking he had them all covered and then you just keep finding more and more that you've never seen before and that this one on the right hand side here that almost looks like some sort of little Star Wars building um, that was also one of the key way markers on our route that we've uh, talked about quite a bit up the hill and this is another human chroma made from Ted's hair after he got a haircut um, you know, quite a sort of singular in appearance, that one. And then I'll just close out very, very quickly. Um, I think you've all been patient if you're still there. Um, these are just some experiments that where I'm running through, trying all sorts of different things, introducing uh, charcoal and plants and herbs and mixing them together and, and also working with um, spices and, and different beetroot powders and, and things like that. And you can see there's this huge potential to make, you know, really dynamic, interesting and, and abstract uh, kind of images with them. And I think that's just about uh, me. And I, I did promise at the end I would give one more plug for Ted's talk, um, which is on Sunday night, because obviously there's there's a bit of overlap in, in the projects, but he's going to come at it from a very uh, different way. So 
if we could pop that in the chat again, that would be um, fantastic. And then we can go and see if anyone's still awake to, to ask any questions. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Morag. That's, uh, yeah, I'm mesmerized by all those amazing images and uh, all the beautiful colors and patterns and shapes. It's a bit kaleidoscopic really, isn't it? When you look at them, absolutely amazing. Um, it's very so, addictive. <laughs> yeah, I bet it is, I bet it is. Um, so there were one or two questions about where you, uh, where you learned to develop a skill of making chromatograms, if that's the right yes. term. Um, so perhaps you could just share a bit about what you did with Hannah and what you did with Juan. Yes. Oh, great. You've got the, the links up there. Fantastic. I found them. You yeah. have to look for them. Yeah. So Hannah was running a workshop with the Land Art Agency. So that was a pretty straightforward. I can't remember if it was, you know, an hour and a half or something like that. And they'll basically send you all the what you need beforehand out and a bit of prep. And then you just work through actually making these things live in the workshop with her. Um, and I think they wrote, um, if you go to the Land Art Agency, I think they run them fairly regularly or maybe a couple of times a year at least. So that's a great starter you know, session if you just wanna dip your toe in the water and make a few chromas and see if it's for you, you know, in terms of the process and, how it all works you know because it's quite it's quite involved in a way you've got to have a whole bunch of materials to work with and then you've got to be really up for going out and gathering either she doesn't work with plants it was, well she might do but this was for soil you know go out and grab soil samples get them nicely dry and you know and obviously you need a bit of space to just have all this clutter all over your your house and letting them dry but you know it's a fun an interesting process so I definitely recommend it to anyone who's kind of seen these and thinks oh yeah I'd quite like to have a go at that um and then with uh Juan I got it was DG Unlimited so local arts organization I got a professional continuing professional development I think it's called grant where you can um you know look a bit further into work you're doing and so for me especially to be able to engage this work in the context of the land use change that we're seeing, you know, in Scotland, certainly um, being able to read a bit more about what we're seeing in those soils and plants um, can just be another way of opening up the conversation. And, you know, I can't see myself stopping because, you know, I'm thoroughly kind of immersed and addicted. And so I, I think there'll be so many more things to learn and observe just through this hands on this brewing of botanicals and the alchemy of it and this wonderful surprise as you take your liquid and you've got no idea what's going to come out on that paper the first time you see it you know and that watching that is so exciting because you see it straight away like the 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 depth of the color might come out more over a day or two but you get a kind of instant feel of of what uh what's coming you know, some of them are a huge disappointment. You're like, God, I thought you'd be way more interesting than that. And then you have others that you think would be really quite dull, you know, do something really quite snazzy. I wonder if there's any questions from anyone else here. Just unmute yourself and, and pose your question. I'd wondered, Morag, for anyone who was looking to take up making chromas as a hobby, uh, is it easier to get access to the materials that you need? I know that there's a few specific things, but is that all quite easily findable? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I tend, because I live remotely, I tend to just go on the internet to, to buy most things anyway. So, yeah, I mean, it, the, the good thing about the Land Art Collective Workshop was they would just itemise the very basic stuff that you needed without going into too much. You know, you could use jam jar lids instead of petri dishes because if you're not looking to scientifically measure and use the results like that you don't have to be as concerned about everything being precision and sterile if you're just wanting to make something visually interesting so yeah you would basically order some silver nitrate powder um which you have to be very careful handling it turns you purple it's not um toxic to humans but it's very to toxic in the you know aquatic system for example um, so again, it, you try and use all of it that you've made, 
And if you can't use all of it, you need to look at a way of um, capturing that silver. So some people would try and kind of extract that onto copper, you know, where it would sort of bind into silver or I've heard also you can pour it onto a brick, um, you know, and the brick holds all the silver. You certainly can't be tipping it down your drain or anything. Um, and so, yeah, silver nitrate, filled papers and distilled water. Distilled water is quite important because obviously, you know, tap water has chemicals um, or can just be harder or softer, but it's got active ingredients that could affect your chroma. So um, better to use distilled. And then caustic soda, just like sodium hydroxide, which I'm really familiar with because when I made soap, it's obviously a fundamental ingredient. I just want to say that I've been lucky enough to see the chromas in the flesh um, and they are beautifully sort of fragile pieces of life is how it struck me. They really are amazing in the flesh, they look great on the screen, but nothing quite gives you the, the sort of sense of delicacy that's seen in the flesh. Uh, I also want to ask, Mara, you mentioned about apex predators in Italy. What's the state of play as regards reintroducing apex predators in Scotland? I guess um, you'd welcome it, would you? I mean, personally, I would, but I do recognise the, the tensions and that all needs to be kind of dealt with. But um, I think they're probably a little bit further ahead on public perception with lynx than they are with wolves. You know, wolves, 99% of people just seem to, you know, want to go and hide when you mention them or Shut get up. very, very irate or upset um whereas links i think there's possibly a bit more sympathy for um if you're interested i literally not long before i came on this today i saw peter cairns from scotland the big picture has just released a, a beautiful little video about um the reintroduction so well worth having a look at that all oh, right great, i found great. it on linkedin but i'm sure if you went on the big picture they were it'll be released on that website um, they're a great source of information and thank you for the lovely things you said about the chromes I think your email is still sitting in my inbox waiting for an answer <laughs> sorry about that it's been, been a bit hectic. busy <laughs> yeah it's been hectic since I got back from London but you also wrote something really beautiful in it was it something about life force or something yes that's they struck me as sort of evidence of life force yeah yeah, it was really nice and I wanted to get back to you on that and because actually I would have probably used it in the talk if I'd have thought about it in time. Um, and somebody else said they, in person, they have a very, very calming presence. Yeah. You know, they're kind of small and quiet, aren't they? But they definitely have some kind of heft to them as objects, I would say. There's something embodied in them, maybe. maybe also, they... From a distance, it looks like a panel of similar work and you get closer and everything is completely different. Mm. You can kind of dive in and get lost in them. I mean, it's a quick fire talk tonight. You know, you could have only had five and just left them on the screen while I was talking and let people get really kind of hypnotised by them. But yeah, yeah. I would, could, may I ask, did you see the exhibition that was hanging in London? Yes, I did. Yeah, you did. And okay. it, was, it was wonderful. And there was some uh, other work from um from both uh, ted and margaret yeah super yeah, and a few a few other artists right. well there was, was lots saying. of really... margaret, margaret. <laughs> <laughs> oh don't worry i got called helen earlier <laughs> um yeah the, there was there was it, the whole it was a group show janie and and the other work was incredible from the other artists as well it was, and nice was it also chr chromographs or was it other work no, it was quite a few photographers. And actually, I meant I thought it'd be really good to bring them to your attention, actually, for the festival. There was um, Carol Sharp um, does really interesting works around, you know, kind of um, trees and soil and mycorrhizal and all of that sort of thing. That's not a very good just, you know, <laughs> I haven't done her justice there. You know, her, her, go and look her up, you know, Carol Sharp, um, yeah. wonderful work. We'll um, Gina Glover as well. A photographer and then um Claire Rosen she does these really kind of whimsical almost still life type photographs but very much often anywhere at the natural world and then there was a couple of illustrators in there as well um well maybe they can pick up with you and, and get their get their names or be introduced that would be that would be yeah good. yeah absolutely and I'm just thinking about this this line of work that you're going down with the the chromographs and the sorts of 
conversation it stimulates because one of the things through our festival it's about getting people uh, experiencing things or talking about things that they maybe haven't considered before mm-hmm. um, but also in the context of our position within the festival of biodiversity should have mm-hmm. gone ahead is around our role as photographers um what we might do mm-hmm. to widen the discussion and debate around what's happening to our environment and the impact on habitats of our actions mm-hmm. what, what are your thoughts on what how we could use our work to stimulate that discussion those discussions yeah, i mean there's all sorts of ways isn't there and there's the question of whether you focus on the negative the destruction type thing or whether you go to the positive um and it probably needs a mixture of both but I I also think there's an element that people know about the destruction and the negative and are still failing to really take on board it's almost something that we just go like this is too horrible I don't want to see it um and, and I don't think it's been a conscious decision for me it really has been for me this interaction with the land that has led me down this path sort of after the initial project um but for me, it just goes back to this abundance coming out of the earth. Um, and I can't remember if I actually mentioned it in the talk. I meant to that, you know, at the moment we measure, if we're assessing land for what we could do with it, we use the baseline of what's there now. And we're of it, uh, very often using a very depleted baseline. You know, so we're looking at the ground after it's been grazed either um, intensively or not. You know, there's not necessarily a lot there. And so we describe that as kind of empty, not much going on, poor, marginal, all the rest of it. When actually, if we see what comes out, if you just leave it for two years and then 10 years, it's alive with all manner of, you know, plants and creatures and potential. And so for me, one of the things I've been wondering is how we could push this idea that we should measure habitat by potential, not by what's actually there at the moment we look at it. Um, And this for me, you know, because I could go and count every species and I could take a photo of it, but I feel like the chromas are maybe more of a engaging way for people to, you know, as Howard was saying, if you see them in person, especially, you could kind of get drawn up to them and you want to look at them individually and and think about all those species. So I can imagine a, you know, like a room covered in thousands of them just taken from one bit of land, you know, maybe one wall with a thousand on and then one wall with just one gigantic one that you could you know just lose yourself right into the middle of um so sorry that was a very me specific answer but you know there's all sorts of ways I think people have to find their way of you know either to what can they relate to where they are what what's around them and how do they bring it into the dialogue because the other thing is is everyone looking in their own garden to begin with whether it's your garden or whether it's 11 acres, what can you do right there? Can you put a window box in or, you know, going a bit further, can you ask your council to start planting uh, perennial flowers, stop using weed killers, stop mowing the grass all the time? You know, there's so many things we can do for biodiversity just as individuals, let alone photographers. Um, But yeah, just, you know, photographing more, plants and beasties and you know sharing them with people and talking about your experience of them I think is as important as the big you know the big highbrow projects. Thank you Morag. I wonder if there's any thoughts or questions to reflect back to Morag from tonight's talk. Everyone's probably a bit bamboozled. I'd been thinking Morag or mm. you clearly getting very into doing the chromas in the past couple of years are you moving a bit away from photography uh and the stuff that you're doing recently are you still doing a lot of photography um i've been doing less traditional photography and more this kind of scrapbooking of things that catch my eye but you know in there's a few people here from the community you know we've got this online community that's in association with um ICM photo magazine I don't know if Stephanie's still here but yes she is uh Stephanie is one of my uh colleagues there well she's she's the boss actually 
Um, and then we, you know, we've got um, Paddy and a few other folks from the community where Beatrice in and um, Kenneth was in for a while. Um, and that's all working with this abstract photography, which is this um, impressionist kind of camera movement uh, type work. And so that focuses specifically around that one type of abstract photography. So I'm still doing a lot of that. Um, and, and increasingly try to bring these stories through that technique as well. So, and that's a really interesting crossover to say, how can a very abstract impressionist photo of nature start to talk around these environmental themes? Um, but I've done two now from the same location of the zero footprint. I thought about putting them in this talk actually, particularly of the willows and the pond and the kind of um, the habitat aspect uh, started to just make these solid little abstract projects from right in that same sort of 50 meters of space. Um, yeah, and find ways to tell a story, obviously, in a much more kind of ethereal way than you can do with something much more concrete. You know, the chrome is a, a kind of fact in a way, aren't they? They're, this is what's in this plant, and you can kind of look at it through this method. Whereas the abstract photography, and Howard does this as well, is, um, you know, it's very much seeing what's in front of you and the light and then bringing your, your own whole mood and expression and intention to it. Um, so that's been a, it's been a challenge, but a really interesting one to, to bring that into the whole um, climate and biodiversity question as well. I wonder if there's any, any, anyone else here tonight who's experimented with any techniques like this themselves, or whether this is this is a new thing for people. Anyone here experimenting with this? Howard, has it inspired you to try it? Uh, yeah, I'd love to try it. I haven't yet. I've, I've done one, I've had a few goes at cyanotypes. That's as near as I've got to. Uh, that sort of style, but nothing using any local produce or my own urine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you don't have, it's, it's not... Um, it's not compulsory. No, no, not at all. Um, and there's a um, Paddy, I see, is also a great uh, cyanotype dabbler in the background there. Um, but oh, yeah, I mean... Definitely, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go on, you go. Well, I was just going to say this definitely has inspired me. I've seen your images, uh, these chroma, how do you say it? Chroma to chroma, You can say chromas or chromatograms. Chromatograms. Sure. I've seen them, you know, and, and they're really wonderful, um, but I've not tried it. But this definitely does encourage me to want to try it myself and see what happens. I think, you know, what you were talking about, when you see a plant um, and then you see the chrom chroma, of that plant, I think it might actually help people see it more as a living thing, mm. you know, because they're seeing that it is alive through those chromas uh, yeah. in a much different way than they see it as just the object itself, I think. So I think that can definitely really spark a lot of um, interest and dialogue in this area mm. and I think as practitioners as well there's something that deepens your relationship going into this nitty-gritty with them as well you know the gathering and the preparation and the having a room full of plants um well yeah because then you develop a more intimate relationship mm -hmm. with uh, with it with the object or with the the plant or the animal or whatever it is that you're working with so there's a lot of definitely a lot of value in that and it really is inspiring I've, I've not really had a full grasp of what you've been working at, Morag, but <laughs> <laughs> with all of this, but I, I do love it. It's it's really amazing. Oh, thank you. If I go quiet for a week, now you know where I am. <laughs> well, I, I've been kind of wondering, but I knew you were um, busy with this this presentation, so no yeah. worries. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the first time I think I've ever done a talk where I've actually made work for the talk. You know, I had some work and a basis and um, I knew what I wanted to talk about, but I had to go out and make those all those extra things and think of the ideas of how to introduce them, um, you know, which I've never done before. So that was really nice to have this relationship where the talk is actually encouraging you to to build on a project in a, a kind of imaginative way. 
Um, because obviously when this was, you know, initially, you know, the Festival of Biodiversity, so that's why it's so heavily orientated as well towards um, you know, the kind of rewilding and getting involved with the the plants and the beasties. Um as, but thank as, you. Yeah. Go on, go as on. Morag mentioned, I've been doing um a lot of cyanotypes. And I've really found that that's changed my sense, the, the foraging beforehand, the, the whole sort of tactile engagement is completely different from, you know, whether or not you, you photograph it or, or just walk past it. But suddenly the foraging, um, bringing it home, um, the, the examination of how it looks, whether how it would flatten, you know, which even the simplicity of looking to see which which is its better face, you know, which which side looks better mm -hmm. when it goes in from three dimensions into two dimensions, uh, and the whole process, say, having this sort of tactile element, even down to the magical bit at the end where you wash it and uh, and suddenly all the richness comes. Um, I have I'm not doing anthotypes at the moment. Um, Medi medically I'm a bit limited but but I say that this whole engagement certainly does create a very different feel um, of of how I look and see and and engage um, and given that I'm a city dweller you know I'm, I'm not looking out over hills and mountains and uh, and trees I'm looking out over uh, the neighbor's house opposite but yeah, but there's still uh, all the potential from the bits you can collect round and about, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a slippery slate, Paddy, let me tell you. I started on cyanotypes. I was thinking that with Howard as well. You know, and then it was anthotypes. Then it's the, the chrome as in there's been other stuff in the middle, you know, direct uh, photograms and chemigrams. And once you start, yeah. I found my email here. Um, all right, which I said, I felt them to be a representation of gentle life force. Oh, that's beautiful. Which and sounds a bit pretentious, lovely. but that's what I felt. So. No, 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 it's beautiful. And that's why I haven't replied, because I want to spend the time writing a proper reply rather than slap dash something back going, cheers, Howard, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so now you know. <laughs> that's lovely. And just on the subject of your exhibiting your work more you you have exhibited in a number of places your chromas and you've just closed an exhibition in london is that right mm -hmm. yeah do you have a plan to exhibit anywhere else not so far but nearly all of these have been really um quite spontaneous i think with the cat strand we had two months notice and so and i literally made all those botanical ones in the week before the exhibition my plan was just to make the soil ones, job done, finished. And then, uh, yeah, it must have been two weeks. And then I spent a week making the botanical ones and then had to just sort of physically force myself to stop so I could present them somehow. And then another spontaneous exhibition came up in a village here in Italy. Um, and again, made more work for it. And it was, Ted was exhibiting it at the Cat Strand one in New Galloway and the one in Italy. Um, with his photographs, bringing in the different elements of biodiversity. And we also had Sophie Deccans, who's quite a famous sculptor in the one in, um, in Italy. And she makes these huge wild boar out of, um, and wolves actually, out of chestnut planks. They're absolutely amazing. She's an incredibly talented um, artist. So these things were huge, you know, they're life size at least. I think we had, so we had three wild boar in the middle of the room there. And we had, you know, things like this hanging up that we just bashed out of plants. Um, and yeah, just, it was, a, that was lovely because we had this three dimensional architecture to everything. And it was sort of almost like walking in the woods going around that one. Um, and then the one in London, of course, was a group show. I'd quite like to take them to somewhere you know, like the Botanic Gardens or somewhere like that, I think. Um, and then also, I quite like the idea of talking to people who've got land or have got a special place and going and doing, you know, Kramer's there for them and then letting them have them, you know, either for their own scientific purposes or just visual purposes, you know, as a way of, again, just opening up the, the land in a different way. 
but yeah, I haven't got any firm plans yet. I'm open to offers. <laughs> contract, must... with the national, contract with the National Trust for all their problems. Yeah, maybe. Go around all of their places, just yeah. chromering everything. I could get a little mobile van where I do it all. <laughs> well, there's, yeah. there's something, a mobile van. Yeah, the mobile chroma van. There's that a lassie be... from Galloway that goes around doing a mobile darkroom on a bike. She's doing the, she does the wet plate collodion technique. Yeah. She's called Kaina. I can't remember what her surname is. It might be Kaina Ray, like R-A-Y. I'd have to check, but she's worth looking up as well. Young lassie. Um, well, we'll certainly and... get these connections from you, but the, the mm. joking about the traveling van. I mean, I think there's, I think taking this sort of thing into communities and exactly yeah teaching the skills and exploring the potential of it and starting the conversations about it much as paddy said it, it takes you into another level of intimacy with your work when yeah. it takes when it takes so much time and so much thought and the whole process uh, involved but yeah it's absolutely something that would be very easy to run community workshops for because you know you can take care of any of the tricky bits you can bring the materials so people don't have to think too much about that side of things um, you know, and I think, you know, even residencies would be really nice just going to stay somewhere for a week or a month and seeing how the place unfolds through because you really are following your nose. You start off with the obvious things that you see first and then you start gradually seeing um, all the other little bits and the nooks and crannies. It's a bit like if you ever go looking for mushrooms, you don't see any at all. And then as soon as you see the first couple, you see them everywhere. You have to kind of you know, tune your eye in a little bit. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I'll look forward to coming to your chroma van. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll get my, <laughs> my fish and chips in one hand or my, my 99 ice cream in one hand and my chroma in the other, that'd be wonderful. It'll have to be a double nugget if you come over our way. <laughs> a I double suppose. nugget, yes. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any sort of final observations or questions for Morag? I wondered, Morag, if you could, you could have taken to botanical gardens. I would have thought Edinburgh, Glasgow, Kew, would they not be interested in doing an exhibition? Yeah, I think it's it's a good idea. And it's probably what I should do next is, you know, start to say I have got this body of work. You know, because even in conjunction with some of the other artists we worked on the last exhibition with, it would be really nice because um, there's all sorts of overlaps but different areas of curiosities, um, either either showing work I've already done or or going there for a little spell and you know making some from that place would be really nice. And like uh, Jane was saying, you know, doing the community workshops. But yeah, it's a good idea. Thank you. There's something that kind of links to a workshop that we have running in person on Sunday in Stirling. And again, I was to be part of the Festival of Biodiversity and it's an environmental artist by the name of Scott Hunter, who's been experimenting with developing traditional film using botanicals. So he's going to talk about his experimental work and he's going to demonstrate. He'll also talk about responsible foraging and that kind of mm, thing. Nice. Uh, but that, that's going to be uh, recorded. Seth's actually going to record that. Um, so it's an in-person workshop. So I appreciate an audience from all over the world here. Um, but that's another interesting development in terms of sustainable. Uh, Absolutely. Practice. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing how how that turns out when he's developing film without the traditional chemicals. Yeah, I haven't done it with film, but I've done it with the photograms that, you know, just so directly making a print on the photographic paper and then developing it with, you know, caffeine and mint tea and urine you can use as well as a mixer. Um, that can be your but, next talk and demonstration, Morag. <laughs> what, 101 ways to use your year and in photography <laughs> and gardening you know so we keep it in the biodiversity thing um, absolutely prob probably not um, <laughs> <laughs> um but you know scott's great and scott does chromatography as well um you know he we he he messaged me after my talk last year because i think i'd like one little page on chromatography and a whole talk didn't i and he messaged me and said, oh, you know, I do that as well. And then we got him down to do a talk in Galloway um, as part of the Galloway Glens Landscape Partnership. So that's really nice, these connections and the way it all kind of branches out. Um, so, yeah, I hope he gets a good turnout because I, I know it will be a brilliant workshop. 
yeah, well, we're looking forward to it. And as I say, we will film it and we'll upload it to our YouTube channel. Um, and this event tonight has also been recorded and will be uh, filmed and, um, sorry, be edited and uploaded to YouTube. But also when you sign off tonight, guys, all that chat should fall into a Zoom file on your desktop. So all the links that we've shared um, should uh, appear for you there. Um, Do they have to manually save it or not? Um... I think if you go into your desktop, I have a Mac, there'll be a file under documents and the client will be oh, okay. available on my, my desktop and it should fall into a Zoom file and it'll just be dated. I think that's what happens, F, is that right? Yes, that's what I always see as well. So you should have any links that have gone into the chat saved there and available to see later. But I'm aware more, I think you mentioned a number of other artists tonight, which I didn't have time to quickly Google whilst you were talking. So if, if you were to maybe share those with us in an email, I can then just email to the group who signed up tonight. Yeah, I will do. I just fired a few in there a very of names, quickly. Brilliant, and we can Google for ourselves. Yeah, but I will, I'll send you the links as well. Um, I think she's Kona Ray, but she might be Kona Rob. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll try and send it over so you've actually got proper links to, to go and look at. Super, that's great. And you've got, do you, are you going to pop Scott's thing in there in case people want to sign up for the recording? Or anyone can watch it on the channel afterwards, right? Anyone. I've put our yeah. YouTube channel link in there. It's just mm -hmm. the Sterling Photography Festival YouTube. And if you go to our website anyway, there's a link in there to our YouTube channel. It's normally... It gives Zef a little bit of breathing space a week or, or two after the event that the event's uploaded. But what I will do when this talk is uploaded, Morag, I will write out to all the people who subscribed for tonight's talk to let them know. Yeah, there. yeah um, fantastic. Otherwise, people will find it on, on, on our YouTube channel. Well, thank you, Morag. Um, absolutely mesmerizing. And I think you've inspired a number of us to get off and make our own chromas. Start foraging. Yeah, <laughs> Start foraging, absolutely. Um, so thank you very much for that tonight. It's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank thank you. you for having me. And thank you so much, all of you, for coming. Really lovely to see so many of you. It's been a lovely turnout. Thank you very much. And lots of lovely comments dropping into chat, uh, Morag. So they'll, they'll drop into your Zoom file as well. Yeah, brilliant. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. And we'll wish you good night. Bye.